very much. I would do, we are being told that we are alive. Allow me to say as much as I can in this first round because I don't want to lose anything. But first, let me apologize for coming late. Uh, when we got to the airport yesterday, my passport says Her Excellency Banda Joyce, H.E. Banda. My ticket said Joyce Banda. So when we got to the airport, they said, this ticket is not yours. Your name is Miss, Mrs. He Banda. We tried to explain H -E, what H.E. means. didn't make sense. And the sad bit is that it's an African airline. So to go, I don't have that kind of patience. But my assistant, Liz, who is sitting here, just bought another ticket. That's how we were able to come. But thank you for inviting us. And thank you for this initiative. I wanted to start by congratulating ECOWAS because in the recent past, ECOWAS has demonstrated that we leaders, I'm, I'm going to be talking about leadership and I'm going to talk about me and my colleagues that are leaders. We can sometimes decide to prolong our stay, we can decide to abuse our people, but ECOWAS has demonstrated that they can intervene and bring us back to our senses. Secondly, I would like to say that from what we have, what I have experienced, I'm going to be talking about what I, I have seen, I have learned as a leader, the lessons that I have drawn, and maybe give examples. We have found that most elections on the continent of Africa today, if they were scrutinized, would end up with the Kenya situation a hundredfold. People suffer in silence. Elections are stolen. The people that come to observe our elections, both local and foreign, will make any decision and declare them very quickly because they don't want to wait, they want to go home. And as a result, countries end up with leaders they didn't choose. And if they are not accepted from day one, if they are rejected from day one, it affects their five years. There's that resentment. So the issues of governance come in, and sometimes we end up with conflict. Secondly, I wanted to start by talking about how I understand leadership. The leadership of today is being redefined. This is not the time you are going to become a president and hope that you can abuse your people and oppress them. The ma masses now, they ask for, they require, they request, they demand accountability. They demand to be given space, to be listened to. And so any leader that wants to save the people must come in as a leader, a leader not a ruler. And anybody who comes in as a leader must put the people first. And you must always remind yourself as a leader that you lead at the pleasure of the people that gave you the mandate in the first place. Simply put, you are the captain of the ship. I was, uh, I've always been told by fellow leaders that you, 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 you always want to blame us. It's not about the leaders. It's collective. It's teamwork. Yes, it's true. But the analogy is as follows. If you are in a bus and the driver is driving you and you end up in a ditch, people will first ask, was the driver drunk? Was he okay? Was he sleeping? So if you are a leader, you must be prepared to take responsibility for what goes wrong and right. I believe that uh, leadership is a love affair. You must fall in love with the people and the people must fall in love with you. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's about you realizing that you are not a semi-god, but you are a human being. And therefore, the people come first, they elected you, they gave you the mandate, you lead at their pleasure, and therefore, you must be accessible. I was asked to look at you. What is it that, um, what are the three key areas that you talk about as the governance going forward, transformative? And um, I picked three, and the final one is, of course, the participation of women and the empowerment of youth and girls. But uh, I decided that uh, I should pick inclusive leadership. The second one being transparency, accountability. 
and, um, and of course, women and girls. When I became president, I realized that at the time that we got in, the country was very polarized. The president had been given six days to vacate state house. The economy had grown by 1.8%. Two million people didn't have food. Companies were operating at 35% and therefore were not able to import raw materials. There was no fuel for a day. The fuel that I even used to go to the funeral of my late president, because I came in when he passed away, was donated by the president of Zambia. The food was donated by the president of Mozambique. President Sata gave me the fuel. So there was no fuel for a day. I decided that with a nation that is as angry as that, as frustrated as that, I needed to hold a national dialogue on the economy. And they chose five six sectors at that event. So every Malawian knew that Joyce Banda has come in to complete the term of President Bingo Mtarika, but in the time available, she has chosen five sectors. And even a villager knew that he, it is infrastructure, it is tourism, mining, energy, and agriculture. And I promised the nation that when we leave in two years, we should have three projects per sector completed. Why am I saying this? One lesson that I learned is that you must engage the masses, no matter how bad the situation. I had to devalue the currency by 47%. And the, my predecessors had, had resisted that because of the hardships it brings to the people. But one lesson that I drew was that when people are informed why you are take, taking certain actions and risks and hard decisions, and if they understand it's on their behalf, they will stand with you and by you. I engaged the public when we had a, a, a problem with Tanzania on the lake border dispute. I invited to State House opposition parties, I invited to State House the faith community, and I invited to State House civil society to discuss this national, this matter of national interest. Why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this to say that when you involve the opposition parties and everybody in the country, they will stand with you. The next issue that where I engaged the whole country the host uh, stakeholders of the country to state house was when I was alerted by the European Union ambassador that money was being stolen through the integrated financial management system in government. I made an announcement. I was going to make arrests. But if you are going to arrest 72 people at one time, you are supposed to invite everybody and inform everybody. Because fighting corruption is not easy. It backfires big time. And you can, they can smear all that back onto you. I was warned all over the place that it wasn't the wisest thing to do. And they promised me that they will fight me for as long as I live. But that's fine. It is not a big deal. If you, are, if you put your people first, then you must be prepared to pay any price. But what I am saying is that even at that time, I invited the opposition parties, the civil society, faith community, and opposition parties to state house. What I am trying to say is that Africa must learn, or our nations must learn to understand that the civil society, NGOs, are not opposition parties. They can be a very strong partner for us. If you are a, a leader and the civil society is engaged, the faith, faith community is engaged, opposition parties are engaged, you can prosper faster. The, the next one is transparency. I believe, that, I believe that, just like my colleagues have said, that press trust, press freedom, is key in a nation if you want to prosper. When I got into office, we, on the global index, we were at 145. When in one year, we went down to 79. In the, uh, on... on, 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 on uh, on transparency, again, it is about corruption. When Cashgate was happened, and the, it was me who, 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 who ignited it, I'm told that globally, 
when you, when you blow the whistle, sometimes you worsen your position on the index. But in my case, I believe that a leader has no choice but to set the precedence. If you indeed claim to love the people that you lead, you will not allow anybody to exploit them or to steal from them. What I must ask, I may not get another chance to say this, but I must say that we are proud as Africans that there is a crop of leaders now on the continent of Africa that have decided to say no to corruption and to fight. But I must also say that this is a global problem. We learned from the Panama Papers. Therefore, it's a fight for both the West and the, the South. We must fight together. I say this because sometimes we hear people say, oh, African governments are corrupt. But then tell me why, as a leader of a country, I have left office, I come in your country, and I buy five houses, and I open FT accounts, you don't ask me where I got that money from. So this is only going to work if we work together, West and South. We must fight together. If I come in your country and I buy houses, ask me how much I was earning and how come I built all those houses. Um, the next one was assets declaration. I didn't draft the bill, but I realized that the, uh, as part of being transparent and accountable to our people, they must see from us that if you have a private jet, you can sell it. You can go on the commercial flight. But also, our, our, our people want to see that when you come into office, you had two houses. And when you come out of office, you have four houses. You must explain where you go to the other two houses. I took that matter to parliament. And I am proud to say that bill was passed as well. So even as I sit here, four years later, Every July, I still have to uh, uh, declare how, what I have, what I had when I went into office, and what I have now, what I have acquired during the year, every July. It is important because it builds trust in the people that we lead. The next one is accountability. I believe that uh, this continent is not poor. I believe that we are a rich continent. Well, it is on, uh, it is in, it is on the internet that the richest man that ever lived was an African. Three, four times Bill Gates was from Mali. Yeah, so what happened to us? I believe that it is very important for us to put our priorities right. I have a dream like Martin Luther King, that a day will come when we shall have diamonds for cash, gold for cash. In our countries, we shall give you, uh, cash transfers right now but the money is done to us from donors. Why can't we use the natural resources that we have? Why can't we use our diamonds to make sure that poor families get money, to make sure that the girl child in that household goes to school? Why is it that in other countries, the same diamonds, the same natural resources have been used to brutalize the people that we lead? Why is it that we don't understand sometimes as leaders that these natural resources belong to the people, they don't belong to our pocket. Why is that hard to understand? So I believe that we must be accountable. The people in our countries must see how their resources are used. They must see who is exploiting them. I take always Botswana as a very good example. From as early as the President Seretse Kama, how he put systems in place that would make sure that they would safeguard the, the diamonds they have. And now today, it's a country that we can all be proud of. Finally, I wanted to talk about, to conclude, I wanted to talk about the issue of women and girls. I have just completed uh, a fellowship at the Woodrow Wilson Center and Center for Global Development. I've been looking at the issue of the girl child and I've been looking at the, girl, the, 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 the issue of women's participation in leadership. The girl child, the African girl child, in a typical rural setup, age zero to ten. I don't have time to go through what is going on there. But I can say that we must work in partnership with the West and make them realize 
that we are grateful for all the resources they bring for the adolescent girl child. And I don't want to undermine that support. But I want to be that when we begin to focus on the girl child, the, the adolescent girl child, it is too late. Most of the initiations, mutilation, trocosh, breast, on, breast, breast ironing, cleansing in Malawi and all that, all that initiations are happening between the ages of 0 to 10. By the time we start focusing on this adolescent girl child, in, as far as I'm concerned, it is too late. I've made recommendations in that paper so anybody can read it. But as for women's participation in leadership and the youth participation in leadership, in, the, in 1964, in the 1960s when we became independent, men and women in their 20s were cabinet ministers. In my country, even the Secretary General of the Malay Congress Party was 20 years old. What happened to us? Why do we tell young people that they are leaders of the future? Why are we prolonging our, uh, 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 postponing their participation in leadership? Why we are losing out? And the youth themselves need, need to stand up and to demand that there will be nothing about them without them. And, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the take to task the African Union to say, we want to participate in leadership. Something has gone seriously wrong. As for women, we were women leaders before colonization. We were leaders on this continent. Number two, we, uh, as a continent, we are doing better than most. If we check, we find that we have had four presidents on the continent of Africa. Other continents are, are still trying to get one woman into state house and failing. But how are they being treated? Why is it that uh, we deliberately want to sideline more than half of our population? As far as I'm concerned, it's a loss to our nations. Somebody has asked, what does feminism mean, mean to you? As an African woman, I say that we work with our men. We work in partnership. We don't antagonize men. We work with them because people insist that they are the problem. Well, then they can be part of the solution. We have benefited as Africans to, 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 to get women in leadership because we work together. Number two, we find that the country with the highest number of women in parliament is on the continent of Africa. So I'm proud to say we are doing well, but we could do better. And it is a matter of common sense that we can participate in leadership. This world is losing out half of its human resource. We are more than 50% of this world. And the last time I checked, we also brought into this world the other half. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, indeed, uh, President Banda, for, for those uh, remarks, um, which in essence tells us that inclusive leadership is key to transformational governance uh, in every sense of the word. And uh, that in addition to this, um, and I guess we'll come back to, to, to that dimension, uh, transformational governance may be desirable, but it is not a tea party. And we must, we must be ready for the battles involved in securing transformational governance.